Hi there, and welcome to this time of worship for Sunday, January 24th, 2021. I'm Reg Berg, and I'm the pastor at Prince of Faith Lutheran Church in Calgary, Alberta. Today is also the third Sunday after Epiphany, and throughout this season after Epiphany, the different readings we'll hear from the Gospels all give us glimpses into some of the different ways in which Jesus' true nature, who he really is, were revealed. Later on in this time of worship, we'll have an opportunity to share in God's gift to us of Holy Communion. Now, on the surface, Holy Communion doesn't look like much. A bit of bread, a sip of wine or juice. But once we look beyond the surface, it is so much more. For us, in faith, these simple, tangible elements become the body and blood of our Lord, given and shed for us. And as we share in this gift, we are connected, first of all, and most importantly, with God, and at the same time with the entire body of Christ, the communion of saints. So today, if you want to share in this gift, there are a couple of things that I want you to know. First of all, and most importantly, I want you to know that you are welcome, period. This gift isn't conditional. It isn't based on who we are, or what we've done, or what we haven't done. It is grounded firmly and solely in God's grace. The second thing is this. You don't have to have anything fancy or even churchy at hand to share in this gift. What matters isn't the stuff itself. It's God's word of promise to us that as we share this gift, Jesus himself is with us. So if you want to share in Holy Communion later, just hit pause for a moment and get a couple of things ready. A bit of bread or a bun or cracker, also set aside a small glass of juice or wine or something. As I said, what's essential isn't the elements themselves, the stuff that we bring to the table. It's God's word of promise connected with it. So if you want to take a moment and prepare that, then hit play again and we'll continue. Even though we're physically separate at this time, we gather together in spirit as members of the body of Christ. And although in different places and perhaps at different times, nevertheless, we worship together. And today we begin by confessing our sin, coming clean, if you will, and even more importantly, hearing God's word of forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Our opening song today, all are welcome. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. 
Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong. be with you and also with you let us pray almighty God by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord amen let's listen to a reading from the Bible Our first reading for today comes from the book of Jonah, chapter 3. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message that I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 
Forty days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had promised. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's join together in reading some verses from Psalm 62, and we'll read them responsively. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, where I will not be shaken. My victory and honor come from God alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. O oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. Common people are as worthless as a puff of wind, and the powerful are not what they appear to be. If you weigh them on scales, together they are lighter than a breath of air. Don't make your living by extortion or put your hope in stealing. And if your wealth increases, don't make it the center of your life. God has spoken plainly, and I have heard it many times. Power, O oh God, belongs to you. Unfailing love, O oh Lord, is yours. Surely you repay all people according to what they have done. Our next song today is one that's maybe not as familiar. It's in our Evangelical Lutheran worship hymnal. Come follow me, the Savior spake.
During this season after Epiphany, our bishops in the ELCIC, also known as the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, have chosen to provide sermons for our Sunday worship services. I think this is a great idea. It gives us an opportunity to hear a different perspective than we might normally hear. But even more importantly, it's a wonderful reminder for us that we are part of a body in Christ that is bigger than what we often realize. Today, the message from God's Word is brought by Bishop Greg Moore, Bishop of the B.C. Synod. A reading from Mark, chapter 1. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fisherfolk. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. The Gospel of our Lord. Ominous words begin today's gospel reading. Now after John was arrested. You can hear the music in the background change. There's a sense of foreboding, of danger. Now granted, these are not the first words in the gospel of Mark, but they're pretty close to the beginning. After all, we're only in chapter 1, verse 14 here. But these are the first words of this large major section of the Gospel of Mark. This begins Jesus' ministry. Before I go further, I want to bring my greetings to all of you across the ELCIC, as well as to the parishes of the Anglican Diocese of Caledonia in northern BC, and to Bishop David Lehman upon his invitation to share in this way for the observance of the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. Now after John was arrested, Reading those words, you know there is more than a hint of danger here. There's a recognition that evil, that sinister powers are at work. There's a darkness that hangs in the air. It's a foreshadowing, certainly, for we know the rest of the story and of what happened to Jesus. Jesus is always mindful of what he will be facing, confronting and encountering in the months and the years ahead. The Gospel writers often refer to Jesus as turning his face toward Jerusalem. Again, another ominous statement. Maybe John's arrest was expected, inevitable. Not only did John confront the religious leaders of the day by using some not very nice words, you brood of vipers probably doesn't sit very well. I mean, that will elicit a few calls to the bishop, I say by congregational members concerned about their pastor's lack of tactfulness. But John the Baptist also had the temerity to challenge King Herod number two. John made the unpardonable sin, from the king's perspective that is, of challenging the king's morality. Herod not only married his own niece, which was verboten enough, but his niece was also married to Herod's brother at the time. Well, John the Baptist didn't think that this was an action worthy of a king, and he said so. He condemned Herod, Herod took offense, and so now John is in prison, and things look grim. Enter, stage right, Jesus. Jesus is from the town of Nazareth in Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is about 30 kilometers to the east. Jesus comes proclaiming the good news of God gospel. This is the Kairos time, the right time. The reign of God has come near. It is at hand, right in front of you, all around you. This is God's time, breaking in, 
among us, in us, through us. Turn around, says Jesus. Repent. You're going the wrong way. The good news is here. God's activity is among you. Then Jesus goes for a walk along the beach. He sees Simon and Andrew, brothers, fishing. And he calls them to come and follow. It's sort of not how we do things when calling someone for ministry. What happened to the colloquy exams for candidates? What of ordinations and council meetings and issuing formal letters of call? No, here Jesus speaks a word. Come, follow. It is a word that invites us, calls us, calls us to something, calls us into something, calls us on a journey for which we cannot know the ending. Simon and Andrew are the first to be called, then Jim and Johnny. There are more to come in round number one of the disciple draft, but these four begin the gathering of the disciples. Now, remember what I said about the theme of the opening statement in this story about John's imprisonment? That is the context in which this call story takes place. It speaks of the hardships and challenges of life, and it speaks of ministry in spite of such things. The gospel calls us, compels us to be people of grace, to be light in this world, salt of the earth, in spite of or maybe because of the difficulties and challenges we face. Jesus calls. Jesus does not promise a life of ease. He certainly does not promise riches and wealth, but he does promise that he will be with us all the way to the cross and beyond. It is this promise of grace and presence that sustains us during the dark moments of our lives. Jesus and John the Baptist faced the reality of despotic rulers and the likelihood of imprisonment, even death. They witnessed evil incarnate. They saw how cheap life was, how easily people were cast aside in their society. For us, maybe it's not evil so much as the reality of life in this day and age. COVID-19 is laying bare the divisions in our society and the systemic injustices all around us. We see more clearly the financial inequities, the extra burdens placed upon the poor and the underemployed, those without security of housing, without secure access to food, without guarantees of work. We see those who are marginalized be even more at risk. We see so vividly how this COVID era has affected people's mental and emotional health, the increasing stress and strain, the challenges many face in their relationships. We see more clearly the fragility of life, the vulnerability of elders in care. And yes, for many of us, for all of us, there is the reality of heartache, pain and sorrow, of isolation and loneliness, and perhaps also the death of a loved one. For many people in this COVID era, there is a renewed search for meaning and purpose. Unsure of their place in this world, of what they want their future to be. Old patterns and ways of being and thinking are being rethought. What can be, should be, needs to be set aside. What am I learning about this time that I want to ensure stays with me as we move forward together? What does it mean to be kind, to be part of community, to live out our faith, to live out this calling that we have been given by Jesus? As the world has changed around us, we're struggling with questions as to what it means to be the church in this 21st century. It used to be we could put up a new church building and people would come and fill it. That doesn't happen anymore. Our world today is quite different. It's increasingly multicultural, increasingly multi-faith. There's a strong emphasis on personal and individual faith where everything is relative. There's a significant consumeristic approach to religion as people pick and choose from a variety of religious and spiritual practices. In addition, religion is often seen as suspect particularly as the radicalism of religion increases. 
as if these challenges were not enough. We're hearing more and more that people simply find the church irrelevant. In light of such dramatic shifts in the world and within the church itself, it is easy to be paralyzed. We often are unsure of what it means to be the church and how to be the church in this day and age. But in the midst of this uncertainty, in the midst of this changing culture, Christ's call to each of us remains the same. Jesus prayed for us with these words, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Such words are a reminder that the church does not exist for itself, but that Christ calls us to be in the world. Jesus' call to us continues to reorient us, to refocus our attention and our action. First and foremost, his call reminds us of our identity that we are claimed by God, adopted, spirited, enlivened. It is Christ who calls us, and it is Christ who sends us into the world. Or maybe a better way to say that is, it is Christ who calls us out into the world in which Christ is already there. To join Christ in the world, walking along the seashore, serving those on the margins, challenging systems of injustice, caring for the last, the lost, and the least, welcoming prodigal children, turning water into wine, and hearing that even a cup of water given in his name is big and huge and Christ-like. Our identity informs our living. That is, our living arises out of our calling, out of our identity. Baptized into Christ, we are called to the same mission and the same ministry to which Jesus himself was engaged. That is our calling. That is our vocation. The word vocation literally means a call or a summons. According to James Fowler, vocation is not our job, our work, or our occupation. It may, of course, include such things, he says, but it should not be limited to one's source of livelihood or identified with one's career. What is vocation then, asks Fowler? He proposes the following. Vocation is the response a person makes to the address of God and to the calling to be in partnership with God. It involves the orchestration of our leisure, our relationships, our work, our private life, our public life, and the resources we steward, so as to put it all at the disposal of God's purposes in the services of God and neighbor. From James Fowler. It's pretty heavy stuff, but what it is reminding us of is that because we have been called by God, all of our life is to be lived in grace, in joyful response and thanksgiving to the grace and love of God. Mother Teresa, among others, says it in a similar way. The story has it that when a young man asked Mother Teresa how he could know what he should do with his life, she responded, where the needs of the world intersect with your gifts, there is your calling. Jesus calls, calls us to follow, calls us to faithfulness, calls us to be like the sower out there sowing the seed regardless of the results. The sower is all too aware of the rocks, the trodden path, the birds, the thorns, but the sower sows nonetheless. Our job, our calling, our vocation is to sow the seed, to serve and love, to worship and praise. Our calling, our vocation recalls the words of the prophet Micah, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Now after John was arrested, Jesus walks beside the Sea of Galilee, and he calls. Simon and Andrew, James and John, me, you. To ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. We walk forward in faith, trusting 
in the God who has called us by name. Come down to the lake shore, seeking neither the wise nor the wealthy, but only asking for me to call. Behold, you have looked into my God has made us God's own beloved people through our baptism into Christ Jesus. Living together in trust and in hope, we confess the faith of the church as we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let's spend a bit of time together in prayer. Guided by Christ made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. Praying together, have mercy, O God. For the church throughout the world, for bishops, for pastors and teachers, for deacons and deaconesses, and for musicians and servers, that all proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love, let us pray, have mercy, O God. For skies and seas, for birds and fish, for favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation, that God raise up advocates and scientists to guide our care for all the earth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who provide leadership in our cities and communities and around the world, for non-profit and non-governmental -gov organizations, for planning commissions and homeless advocates, that God inspire all people in the just use of wealth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for the outcasts and all who await relief, that in the midst of suffering, God's peace and mercy surround them. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For our congregation and community, for families big and small, and for the organizations that bring people support, support from day to day, that God's steadfast love serve as a model for all relationships. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For the nations of our world, and especially for our na neighbors in the United States, that would they would know peace and be empowered in working together for the good of all. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. In thanksgiving for our ancestors in the faith whose lives serve as an example of gospel living, that they point us to salvation through Christ. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of our, your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. A few minutes ago, we heard Bishop Greg talk about Jesus' call to his first disciples, his inviting them to follow him and to share in his mission. We too are called to follow Jesus and we too are invited to share in his mission. One way that we can do this is by sharing some of what God has blessed us with for the sake of the work that God is doing through his church in our world. And in sharing from what God has blessed us with, we in turn can be a part of blessing others. So now as we consider both how God has blessed us and how we might share this blessing with others, I invite you to join me in an offertory prayer. O oh God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child with arms open wide. Nourish us in you in your tender care and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son, and in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn as we say together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Holy One, the beginning and the end, the giver of life. Blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you in the darkness and in the light. 
Blessed are you for your promise to your people. Blessed are you in the prophet's hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. Blessed are you for your son Jesus, the word made flesh. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. So let us proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection. We look with hope for his coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us. Bless this meal. May your word take flesh in us. Awaken your people. Fill us with your light. Bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel, Word of God incarnate, power of the Most High, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So take and eat the body of Christ given for you and given for me. And take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you and shed for me. In the bread and wine of Holy Communion, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has himself come to you and he forgives you all your sins and he empowers you to go in his name, to share his amazing love and grace wherever you go. Love as freely as you have been loved. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in God's grace. Amen. Let's pray together. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. And receive a word of blessing. God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. I just want to make a couple of quick announcements today. First of all, Prince of Faith's AGM will be held today, January 24th at 1 o'clock via Zoom. We sent out an email to everyone in our distribution list inviting you to register for this. And if you haven't done so, please, please respond immediately. If you didn't receive this, please send me a note right away. Pastor at PrinceofFaith.ca just a heads up as well, about three weeks from now, on February 17th, the season of Lent will begin with Ash Wednesday. Now, unfortunately, this year we won't be coming together on Shrove Tuesday for a pancake supper, for obvious reasons, 
but we will still have a time of worship on Ash Wednesday itself. In preparation for that, we'll be mailing out a note to everyone on our regular mailing list, and along with this note will be everything you'll need to take part in the service, including a little Ziploc baggie of palm ash that you can use in the service. So keep an eye out for this envelope when it arrives, and know that it'll have a small baggie of a grayish black powder in it. If you aren't on our mailing list and would like to receive this so you can share in this time of worship, again, please send me your address. My email is pastor at princeoffaith.ca. Our closing song today is one that we might have a hard time singing along with sitting down. <laughs> we are marching in the light of God. Marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching, marching, we are marching. Oh, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching, marching, we are marching. Oh, we are marching in the light of God. We are Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. We will. We will. Thanks be to God.